Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the last video we looked at the HLSL and C++ code for pre-filtering cube maps for the diffuse component of image-based lighting. Today I'm going to show the C-sharp and WPF XAML code that I added for supporting IBL pre-filtering and displaying the resulting textures. One issue that we can run into when importing HDR images in an uncompressed format is that we get a floating point color format as we see here when I re-imported this texture. Until now we were only able to display textures that have 8 bits per color channel. In order to display formats with 16 or 32 bits per color channel, we have to update the helper method which creates images that can be displayed in WPF. This is the image from slice method, which as you can see here, has a lot of additions. It's a bit hard to read this way, so let's look at its current updated code. In order to determine the number of bytes per channel, I added another helper method that's basically just a switched statement. We see that it returns 4 as the number of bytes per channel for 32-bit floating point formats, it returns 2 for 16-bit formats and 1 for 8-bit formats. Looking at image from slice method, we now pass the image format in addition to the other two parameters. Just to summarize what this method does, it takes the uncompressed pixel data that we get back from our texture importer and creates a bitmap image that can be displayed in WPF. Whereas before we just assumed 8-bit channels, now we call this new method to get bytes per channel. We can then use this to handle cases for 32-bit and 16-bit colors. I didn't add all possible combinations, but just the ones I had to deal with. I may add more in the future, and as we'll see in a minute, it's also not that hard to do so yourself. As before, we determined the WPF image format here. Right away you can see that a format with 8 bytes per pixel is missing, so you'll have to add it if you've got source images in that format. The case for 32-bit floating point format is the easiest one. We just copy the pixel data to this byte array from which it will create the bitmap image. When we have 3 or 4 bytes per pixel and 1 byte per channel, we again copy the entire buffer of pixels, but this time we have to swap the red and blue channels, because there is no RGBA32 format in WPF we can choose from, but there is a BGRA32 format, for some reason. When we have 4 bytes per pixel and 2 bytes per channel, that means that we only have 2 channels. Here we assume that the channels contain half-precision floating point values. Of course there are also integer formats, but I didn't implement those. For half-precision formats, we have to convert each pair of bytes to a floating point value. We group the pixel data using the group by link method. Using this offset variable, it will generate a key for each group and the number of keys is half the number of bytes in the array. This causes each group to consist of two bytes. Then for each group, we use a bit converter helper method to convert the two bytes to one half precision float. Then we put the result into an array. We write each pair of floats to the red and green channels of a single precision floating point buffer. The format and stride variables are updated accordingly. We do the same thing for single channel floating point formats with 4 bytes per channel. In this case we only write to the red channel. Next we have two channel formats with 1 byte per channel. This is the same as before where we write to blue and green channels since it's a BGR format. For normal maps, we calculate the red channel here. I also added support for single channel half precision floating point formats, where the conversion is exactly the same as for the dual channel format. But now we only write to the red channel. Finally, we have single channel 8 bit grayscale formats, and in this case, we can again do a simple copy of the buffer. At the end, the bitmap image is created to be displayed in the texture editor, or for making an icon for the texture asset. Well, that was everything that was added to helpers.cs. We look at the content tools api.cs next. Here I moved a few methods from content tools api static class to texture data. 
As you can see, we were giving each method a reference to texture data. So I decided it's better to just make them a part of texture data class. We'll look at them in a second, but first I replaced this method parameter by texture import settings instead of passing a texture. I also added a clone method to texture info so we can create a copy. This is needed for handling pairs of cube map textures as we'll see later in this video. As I just mentioned, I moved these methods to texture data class. The only difference is that now we can access data members directly instead of through a method parameter. In case of slices from binary, it's the exact same copy. Then we have slices to binary. Note that these two methods are static. Get slices, get icon, set subresource data, get texture data info, and get texture info are all public members of texture data class. I also added a clone method in order to duplicate the texture data. Again, this is needed for when we import pre filtered cube map textures. I reformatted this a bit, and this part is all methods that were moved up. Here we are importing the two new API functions for pre-filtering diffuse and specular IBL. We see that since these methods are now part of texture data, we can call them as member functions. Also note that we are only passing the import settings to this method instead of the texture class. The import method doesn't return a tuple anymore. We'll see how the data is set for textures in a minute. Again here we are passing the import settings. These two lines were removed and I added this block to handle pairs of pre-filtered cube maps. This part is skipped if it's not a cube map or we don't want to pre-filter it. In that case we get texture info as before and this time Instead of returning a tuple, we call a new method from texture class to set the data. I'll show you this code a bit later. Note that in addition to image slices and the icon, we are also providing a diffuse IBL cube map, which of course can be null. It's not null, however, if we successfully pre-filter a cube map in this section. Then we clone the texture data and call both pre-filter diffuse and pre-filter specular asynchronously. In the meanwhile, if the texture already had an IBL pair, we use it for the diffuse cube map. This is a new property of texture class, which we'll also discuss next. We wait for diffuse pre-filtering to be done and then we set this data for the diffuse cube map again using the new method. Here we are also providing a reference to the texture asset. Before moving on, we wait for the specular pre-filtering to be done as well. Remember that we haven't implemented this yet, and for now we'll just use the original cube map. However, when we do implement this, the result will be contained by the texture asset. By now you probably already figured out that texture and diffuse IBL form a pair that point to each other using the IBL property. And that's why we provide each texture by its counterpart. Let's look at the entire code in Content Tools API as it is now. Next is texture.cs. I added this namespace in order to be able to call the new static methods, which were moved to texture data class. Here is a bit of code formatting. I added a new private boolean member variable. We'll see how it's used in a minute. As we saw earlier, we have a new property of type texture that points to either a diffuse pre-filtered cube map or a specular pre-filtered cube map. Obviously, this should be null when this texture is not a pre-filtered cube map. We also have this boolean property we can use to check if this texture is indeed pre-filtered. When we re-import a pre-filtered cube map as a 2D texture, we might still have the old IBL pair, but we can use this boolean to make sure that the texture editor is not confused. 
Here we have the set data method that the importer calls with the results from texture importer. It's basically the old import method that's refactored. So it looks like this. Here we set the slices array and the icon, validate texture dimensions and create a thumbnail as before. The new part is that if we have an IBL pair parameter that's not null, we set the new properties accordingly. The import method is much simpler now and just calls content tools API import, which in turn will call set data to pass the results. Where we save the texture, I added a new block to handle saving IBL pairs. Since we are saving two assets at the same time, we used this new member variable to prevent an infinite loop where the two assets keep calling each other's save method. In order to make this work, I also made some changes to the asset registry class and fixed the bug there as well, which I'll show you a bit later. When saving the asset, if it already exists in the asset registry, we can use its full path and ignore the file name. This is to handle assets that were renamed and no longer have the file name that's generated here. Here we check that the pairs point to each other and that the other asset is not saving. Since the save button is only enabled for the specular part, it means that we only get here when we are the specular cube map asset. Therefore, we generate a file name for the diffuse part only if this is a new asset that didn't already exist. Otherwise, we use its current full path. We use this file name to save the diffuse part if this is indeed a pre filtered cube map, otherwise, we'll delete the asset file where the diffuse part was saved. When writing the data to each file, we also save the GUID for the IBL pair texture. This is an empty GUID if the texture is not pre filtered. We return an empty list if anything went wrong, but we'll always reset the saving variable to false. When compressing and decompressing the assets data, we use texture data's static methods, which we moved from Content Tools API class. The last addition to this file is in the load method, where we read the GUID of the IBL pair, and if it's not an empty GUID, we look its file name up in the asset registry. If we got a file name, we can try and load the asset. Note that here, checking the IBL pair being null, make sure that we are not going to call the load method in an infinite loop. In Content Watcher, I rewrote this method using the arrow notation. Otherwise, it's the same. As I mentioned, I updated the code of the asset registry. Here I renamed asset dictionary to asset file dictionary and added another one for asset GUID. This way we can find assets using their path or their GUID. In register asset method, we check if an asset file with this name is already registered. If that's not the case or the registered asset is older, then we update its register time. If it was an older asset and its GUID is different, we'll remove it from the GUID dictionary. Then we update or add the new entry in both file and GUID dictionaries. If the asset was indeed new, we also add it to the list of assets, otherwise we replace the old asset info with the new one. In onRegister asset method, we remove the asset info from the assets list and asset file dictionary. However, we only remove it from GUID dictionary if the file with the GUID doesn't exist anymore. This way we can handle the cases where the file is renamed and therefore has the same GUID. In reset method, we clear all dictionaries and the list of assets. At the end, I updated these methods to get asset info by file path or by GUID. And here is the whole file again. The next file is content browser views code behind. Here I used this method which simply returns null when it fails. Open editor panel is updated and doesn't need the asset GUID as its parameter. We can get the GUID directly from the asset info parameter. We also don't compare the GUIDs directly. I made this part in order to avoid opening a window for an asset that's already been loaded in an editor. 
Now since we have IBL pairs, we should check if a texture editor has any texture asset with this GUID. So I added check asset GUID method to the asset editor interface, which all editors need to implement. In case of the texture editor, it looks like this. So we return true if the current asset has this GUID, or the texture asset has this GUID, or the texture's IBL pair has this GUID. Here we had a visual brush that was referred to by texture editors in order to display the background grid. However, since every open editor window would refer to the same instance, it would pan and zoom for all open windows, which obviously is not the right behavior. So now we create the instance in the texture editor control and only refer to the canvas. As you can see here, the old reference is removed and I added a visual brush here and set its visual property to refer to the canvas resource. In geometry editor, the asset GUID property is replaced with a private member variable in the same way as we did for texture editor. The check asset GUID simply returns true if the asset GUID is the same as the GUID parameter. Here we set the member variable instead. And this should use the current LOD index, which was a bug before. Set asset now returns a task, and again we use the member variable here. I also added this debug message. And here is the asset editor interface that is implemented by geometry editor and texture editor classes. In the main windows AML file, I added the project name to the title of the window, so it's easier to see which project we are working in. Looking at the texture editor next, here we have again the private member variable. We've already seen how check asset GUID method is implemented in textureeditor.cs. This set asset method is part of the asset editor interface, but I also added an overload that uses an asset directly. As we'll see shortly, this one is called from the texture editor's code behind when we switch between diffuse and specular pre-filtered cube maps. We are also passing the texture format to generate slice bitmaps. As we saw earlier, image from slice helper method needs the format in order to determine the number of bytes per color channel. And here is the actual code in textureeditor.cs. This trigger in texture detail view makes sure that the import settings are disabled for diffuse cube maps, which we marked by clearing the list of image sources. In texture editor view, I added this button that switches between diffuse and specular, which is only visible for pre-filtered textures. When the button is pressed, we call the overloaded set asset method to display the IBL pair texture. Since both textures point to each other, this will cycle between the two textures. And this was everything that was added to the code for the level editor. In the next episode, I'm going to try and explain the theory of important sampling and how it's used to do pre-filtering for the specular component of the image-based lighting. Thank you as always for joining me and I'll see you next time.